Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, we will be all accountable to Jesus when we stand in front of him in his holy presence. But the preachers, well, they'll be double, triple accountable for what they were preaching about, or for what they, what they were teaching about. Anyways, let us bow for a short prayer, and we'll go into Matthew chapter 18. Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for the gift of your precious Holy Begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior, the rock of our salvation, our precious Redeemer. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work in our hearts, for encouraging us, for correcting us, for comforting and soothing us whenever we need that. Our Trader God, whom we are worshiping in the spirit and the truth, we are asking for your blessings upon this message and bless our hearts to be a uh, fruitful and faithful doers of your words in our lives. That's what we ask and pray for, for faithful application of this word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6. Let me just read the text to your attention, and then we'll just go verse by verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore will humble himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. The king's rebuke, entering the kingdom of God. This is the title of this passage. Chapter 18 of Matthew has been called by many Christians the discourse on greatness and forgiveness. The teaching on greatness and forgiveness. This chapter 18 gives us principles of conduct that are suitable for those who claim to be subjects of God's kingdom. The Holy Bible describes believers in God by using many different names. However, more frequently than anything else, believers in one true God are called children. In both Old and New Testaments, in the scripture, children of God are called children of the light, dear children, beloved children, children of promise, etc. It is quite a definition to be called children of God. As children of God, we enjoy His Heavenly Father's love, protection, power, and all other resources for all eternity. We have our Father, who is in heaven, who looks after us, who loves us so deeply, so sacrificially, who has given us enough spiritual power and resources to conduct, to expand His kingdom in this world. But there is another side to being children of God. In the Bible, we can see that children of God are often weak, dependent, immature, vulnerable, sometimes disobedient, and even rebellious, like any child. I hope you do remember yourselves when you were kids. If you forgot, Talk to your parents. They would remind you how lovely, obedient, uh, peaceful, uh, unrebellious you have been all the time, all the years of your childhood. For instance, have you ever asked yourselves such a question? Why do some believers have such a difficult time getting along with each other? Does anyone have a good and solid answer? I'm asking you. Why do some believers have such a difficult time getting along with each other? Raise your hand and say aloud your answer for all of us to hear. Why can't we always get along? Okay. The flesh. The flesh. The old man. 
I must say amen. The flesh, the old man, the old man. I heard different times in my life, uh, in Ukraine and in Canada, this answer when I spoke to Christians about the denominations. So they told me, yeah, we kind of like you. You are like a cousin. I asked, why can't you call me a brother in Christ? You're a cousin in Christ, a cousin. Why? Because you believe this stuff, we don't believe this stuff. And uh, I asked her, well, will we be all in heaven? Yes. And I had to answer the following question. So then what's your point? I'll be in heaven, you'll be in heaven, you and his cousins, but this kind of sounds weird. If you, if you cannot call me your brother in Christ, but cousin in Christ. That's interesting. Someone wrote such a poem on the issue. Just listen. To live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. How true this poem is. Whenever we think of those saints who've gone already to heaven, all those saints from other centuries and across the globe, people of strong faith, men and women, but when we just look around to love this brother and this sister, give me a break. I mean, it's hard, Lord, you know how challenging for me, how difficult for me to love this man of God, a woman of God. It's hard. We desperately need what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 18. In the passage, we're going to study this morning, the Lord Jesus rebuked his disciples' pride and desire for worldly greatness. And he taught them one very essential thing, to keep the unity and harmony among them. Point number one of this message sounds like this. Who can enter the kingdom of God? The need for humility, an example of humility. Verses 1 through 4. Let me read verse 1 uh, one more time. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, I can't stop myself from reading it right now. And he called a child to himself and sat him before them and said, and we'll just read the Jesus answer a little bit later on. He called the child, a child to himself and sat him before them. Here's a very revealing question in verse 1, followed by a very revealing answer from Jesus Christ. Someone noted a long time ago that humility is the grace that when you know you have it, you have lost it. That's how it works, unfortunately, in our this fallen condition due to our pride, due to our flesh and other unpleasant things. Humility is the grace that when you know you have it, finally, I got it, Lord, I have it, you have lost it. In verse 1, we're dealing with the disciples' question. The disciples' conception of the kingdom of God and of rank in that kingdom was entirely worldly. Their question fitted so well with common Jewish discussions about hierarchy in various walks of life. The disciples' question recalls Jesus' teaching in Matthew 11, 11. Here's a verse, 11, Matthew 11, 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Which one of us is the greatest? Was the disciples' common topic of discussion, for we find it mentioned more than once in the gospel. To prove this statement, let me read for you from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. We'll just flip over a page or a couple of pages in your Bibles and we'll be there. Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit on your right and one on your left. A nice loving mouth. 
looking after her adult, adult sons. Well, they're still my little boys. They need to have some nice suitcases and portfolio in your heavenly kingdom, Lord. He asked her, what do you wish? And I'm quite a common mom, wishing all the best for the boys. It happened just seven months later. This time, an almost identical question came from the lips of James and John's mother. That was their mom. It must have been painful for Jesus that the self-seeking request came right away after he, pre he had predicted his suffering and death. In the same chapter of Matthew, Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19. Just listen what the Lord had told them prior to that. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him over to the Gentiles to mock and flog and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. He had told them about his coming suffering, his crucifixion, to redeem the human race. And they're still thinking about high ranks in the kingdom of God. How about my son? How about this son of mine? Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Let's go back to Matthew 18. The present grammar tense of this verb to be is underlines disciples' concern about their current status and privilege rather than future rewards in heaven. Now, Lord Jesus, we want our status and honor and rent right now. We don't want to wait. In the context of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, the Lord Jesus, remember, signaled out Peter, James, and John to witness his transfiguration on the mountain. Jesus had sent only Apostle Peter to take a coin out of the fish to pay the temple tax. After all, it was only Apostle Peter out of the twelve who walked on the water. And the fact that Jesus had been sharing with the twelve the truth about his coming suffering and death did not affect them. They still could not get it. They were thinking only of themselves and what position they would have in his kingdom. They actually argued with one another about that in Luke 9.46. Gospel of Luke 9.46 says, Now an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Unbelievable. They were following Jesus for three, three and a half years. They were able to see all his power, all his miracles. They heard firsthand his teaching, the gospel proclamation, and they were arguing, who is the greatest among us? Let me state it as clear as possible. The selfishness and disunity among God's followers are a scandal to the Christian faith. And what causes all these problems our human pride is the biggest issue when we think of ourselves as more important than we really are. When Christians live for themselves and not for others, then they are bound to conflicts and divisions. That's what happens or has happened in the history of Christianity many times. Now let us read Jesus' response to his arguing disciples. Verses, uh, verse 3. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In this verse, Jesus shows the conditions of entrance into his kingdom. True childlike humility. The disciples were very sure that they already belonged to the kingdom of God and the, the only question concerning them was how high up in it they would reach. Jesus answered verse 3 was like a dash of cold water to their self-confidence and arrogance. 
the answer sounded something like this. First, make sure that you go in at all. What you will never do as long as you keep your present and ambitious minds. This teaching of Christ on true humility is desperately needed in the churches nowadays, where selfish ambition is widespread, an obligation to perform our duties to other children of God is so often ignored. Like all of us, like all of us, the disciples needed a lesson on humility. And here the Lord used a child as his illustration. A child. He called a child to himself and sat him before them. The original Greek uh, word for child, by Dion, stands for a very <coughs> young child, a toddler, sometimes even an infant. In verse 2, probably a toddler old enough to come to Jesus when he called him to himself. Mark 9.36, remember the principle of Bible interpretation, the scripture interprets the scripture. Mark 9.36 says, And taking a child, he sat him before them, and taking him in his arms, he sat to them. What is the lesson over here in verse 3? To be a genuine believer, a man must abandon thought of personal greatness and take the lowly position of a little child. This attitude should continue throughout his Christian life. God calls us to live in all humility like little children, as long as we're here in this flesh. Entrance into Christ, Christ's kingdom requires childlikeness. There is no other way to receive the gift of salvation than as a child unless you are converted. Translates a Greek verb, strafo, which means in the New Testament Greek, turning or turning around. It means to go in the opposite direction. According to 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, that's what Holy Spirit left for our edification through Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 says, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Become like children. What does this phrase mean? A little child, toddler, is dependent, helpless, and ambitious, naive, and trusted in others. Speak to your parents if they're still around. Ask them when you were two, three, four year old, how powerful you were. You were. Toddlers, are less hypocritical than adults. It is much easier to read their behavior and motivation. We learn hypocrisy in the art of acting, especially in public, as we grow up. We have great examples to follow. Not really great examples, how to learn hypocrisy. But kids are a little bit different. They're still little cute sinners. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven Jesus makes it clear here that you rise higher in his kingdom as you go lower. The way of self is the way of disqualification from the kingdom. Those who glorify self will not even enter the kingdom of God. James 4, 6 says. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to, finish, to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 4. Whoever therefore will humble himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The message of this verse is simple. The greatest person in the kingdom of God is the one who humbles himself as a little child. Take the lowly position of a little child. This attitude should continue, as the Catholic said before, throughout his Christian life. It, is, it does never stop. Now, time to move to, to verses 5 and 6. Our Christian duty to little ones in the kingdom of God. Verses 5 and 6. 
And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. It seems that Christ blends two concepts in these two verses, verses 5 and 6. The little child as an example of humility and the child of God regardless of his age. As Jesus' followers, we must receive all God's children and seek to serve them. It is a serious matter before holy God to cause a child to sin or to lead him or her astray. It is a serious sin before God to cause another believer in Jesus to stumble because of our poor example. True humility thinks of others and not of self. Believers in Jesus must receive one another with kindness, care, and love, opening up their hearts to welcome fellow believers, baby Christians, toddler Christians, no matter who they are. We need to care for each other like precious children. It is Christ's message to his church from this parable. Verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. There is nothing in this world more horrible than to destroy somebody's innocence. It's been one of the most vicious crimes to misuse and abuse and exploit children across the world throughout the human history. However, there are lots of wicked people nowadays before the second coming of the Lord. They want to destroy the innocence of children. In these days of child abuse and neglect, we must take Jesus' warning seriously. According to our text in Matthew, it is better to drown with a heavy millstone around one's neck than to abuse a child or a child of God and face divine judgment. The very size and weight of millstone show the awfulness of condemnation. Better to die a violent death than to cause other children of God stumble. Conclusion application from this parable. Number one, humility begins with self-examination and it continues with self-denial. That is what God in Scripture calls us to do. Examine yourselves and continue to live a life of self-denial. This life is not about you. This life is about Jesus Christ and His kingdom. This life is about His bride, the Church of Jesus Christ. You know what? I must tell you. It has just come into my mind right now. So many times, and you heard this statement, I'm sure. I heard so many times. I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church or the churches around me. Really? But the church is the bride of Christ. How on earth can you love Jesus if you cannot stand the bride of Jesus Christ? Give me an answer. How can you love Jesus if you hate his church? Because you were offended or somebody did something wrong to you? Okay, but to hate the bride of Christ, that's too much. Point number two, the humble person lives for Christ first and others second, and he or she puts himself or herself last. Christ first, others second, and put yourself last. Three, the truly humble person uses God's gifts to the glory of God. Four, when we welcome another child of God, we welcome Christ. Even if that child of God is Pentecostal Christian, Charismatic Christian, Mennonite Christian, but if he or she is a child of God, we welcome Christ. And I'm not even saying Baptist. I think that's understandable. Baptists are good. 
<laughs> Point number five. A lifestyle characterized by causing others to sin is incompatible with true discipleship. A lifestyle characterized by causing others to sin is incompatible with true discipleship. For a minute or so, uh, let us turn to Matthew chapter 5, to the Sermon of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That's a very serious warning from Jesus Christ to all of his followers across the century. Be very careful. Treat other children of God with all love, care, and respect. And a quote from Jerry Bridges, American theologian and author of some Christian books. From his practice of godliness, written by him in 1996, the truly godly person never forgets that he was one time an object of God's holy and just wrath. He never forgets that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and he feels along with Paul that he himself the worst of sinners. Good quote. And the Bible verse from the Old Testament, from the book of Proverbs, 15.33. The fear of the Lord is the discipline leading to wisdom, and before glory comes humility. Before glory comes humility. There's no other way than true child likeness, humility. That's a major lesson of this parable of Jesus Christ to all of us in a broad sense from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6. Let us pray and give God the glory for this lesson, for this parable. Heavenly Father, if we still have some pride, arrogance in our hearts, if we experienced bursts of self-confidence, self-assurance, please forgive us, convince us, and cleanse us out with your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit of God, because it is a dangerous spiritual condition to be proud. Also, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the power of your Holy Spirit, we are praying for us to love and welcome other Christians deeper and more joyfully and openly. Because eventually, we cannot see the hearts of men and women. You can. We only see the external behavior. We can see the demonstration of what's inside the human heart. But you can see us as we are. Lord, thank you for the lesson of this parable. That if we want to enter the kingdom of God, there's one condition. We must enter. We are to enter. We ought to enter. We need to enter having this childlike attitude of humility. Lord, teach us. Correct us to be more and more humble, following your example. The best example is you yourself, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You humiliated yourself. You came down to this fallen world from the glory and beauty of heaven to save us. You left the glory, the beauty of presence of the Heavenly Father to save us, to set us free from all the bondage of darkness and the devil's shackles. Lord, thank you for who you are in our lives and for your glorious gospel, for the message of salvation. Bless us and teach us and use us as your humble vessels in your porter's hand. That's what we're asking to pray for. 
and all God's children said, in the name of Jesus, Amen.